Good evening, everyone. My name is Beatrice Dionigi, and I'm one of the junior staff here at Cleveland Clinic. It was a true pleasure to be invited by Dr. Richard to give you this lecture as part of your ACS Quarantine Surgical Education Lecture Series. While thinking about potential topics to discuss, I got to the conclusion that maybe it would have been interesting to get you through everything you always wanted to know about J-Pouch surgery. Well, let's be honest, I didn't really come to that conclusion right away. At first, I was planning to focus my entire talk showing you the results of IBD research in New Frontiers of Biologics and Immunomodulators. But I gave my husband a dry run last night and he told me that it was so boring that within a matter of minutes, all of you guys would have shown video exhaustion. So we'll make this IBD talk about something we're all passionate about, surgery, and in this case, about pouch surgery. But before we merge ourselves in the technical details of this topic, let me express my gratitude for being part of the Cleveland Clinic Colorectal Surgery Department and its legacy. This legacy began with Dr. Fazio, a true master in pelvic pouch surgery, and it was inherited, kept alive, and innovated by my mentor, Dr. Tracy Hall, current president of ACRS and worldwide expert in pelvic pouch and redo pouch surgery. Approximately 20 to 30 percent of patients with UC will undergo surgical intervention during their lifetime, and up to 10 percent will require surgery within their first year of diagnosis. Many are the indication for elective surgery as well as for urgent or emergent procedures. As all are, you are well aware, many are the risk factors of patients affected by UC, including malnutrition, high dose of steroids, as well as escalating doses of biologics and immunomodulators. Usually, patients with UC are offered a three-stage surgical approach. Sometimes, two-stage approach can be offered to a subcategory of patients. The stage approach aims to decrease the incidence of serious complications, including pelvic sepsis. In addition, it allows to optimize the general medical condition of the patients, improve their nutritional status, and win off medical therapy following the surgery. The first step is to offer a total abdominal colectomy with andeliostomy. Most colorectal surgeons nowadays would perform this procedure laparoscopically or robotically based on the training received. The procedure itself aims to remove the offending colon and based on surgeon preference would leave a long rectal stump in the pelvis or as I've trained here at the clinic would implant the long rectal stump suture line under the skin above fascia to protect the abdominal cavity and the pelvis if a leak of the suture line would happen. So later, we would proceed with the most delicate stage, the completion protectomy, creation of the J pouch, creation of the iliopouch anal anastomosis, and uh, the diverting loop ileostomy. In this slide, you can appreciate all the steps of the procedure, which would follow sequentially with great care of choosing the right spot in the small bowel to become the pouch, aligning precisely the two fires of a GIA 100 stapler, amputate the J tip, making sure it is not too long, and the staple line is oversewn. Check the pouch and making sure there's no serosal tear and there's no ongoing bleeding from the staple lines, and then place the first string and the anvil. When creating the iliopouch anal anastomosis, great focus and attention should be on checking the mesentery of the pouch, which should be straight with all the remaining of the small bowel on one side, and making sure before firing the stapler that vagina or prostate are out of the way. After the anastomosis is made, the pelvis is filled with saline, and an air leak test is performed. 
a lupuleostomy is then matured with great care uh, in choosing the right spot for that too. But what if you're ready to bring your anvil and your pouch down in the pelvis and you don't have reach? Well, yes, that's probably your face or my face. Uh, we will be sweating and hyperventilating and tachycardic. But again, there is no need to panic. There are a few options. First of all, you would have prepared your patient and yourself for this scenario well ahead of surgery. Reach could always be a problem, especially in thin, tall males with foreshortened mesentery. Second, even if you are very proud of your 5 mm incision, there is no problem if you have to open and allow the pouch to allow the pouch in the pelvis. Then there are several maneuvers that you can perform to increase length of the mesentery. The maneuver that makes me more concerned to do, definitely scoring the mesentery. Creating the mesentery windows could cause formation of hematoma and loss of blood supply to the small bowel. Worst case scenario, if you don't have reach and all this maneuver don't work, well, you can leave the pouch anchored in the pelvis and try another day. If your second stage proceeds uneventfully, then six to eight weeks later, after a GGAE confirms that there is no stricture or leak or sinus or other issues, then you would proceed in taking down the diverting ileostomy, leaving your patient in continuity. Of course, prior to this operation, you will need to continue to teach and instruct your patient regarding the realistic expectation that they have to have about number of bowel movements per day, continence, especially at the beginning, uh, just after the ileostomy is closed, and especially at night. Unfortunately, complications of the pouch are well known to everybody and can affect your patient pouch function and quality of life in the acute setting as well as long term. As Dr. Fazio and Dr. Hall will tell, complications within six months from the surgery are frequently related to technical issues and problems right after ileostomy closures are usually problems related to surgery technique until proven otherwise. Long-term sequelae, on the other hand, may raise suspicion for Crohn's disease or other pathology. So how can we protect our uh, patients and prevent pouch complication to happen? Well, we just need to follow what uh, Dr. Hall usually says and her advice. First of all, don't hurry while you are in the operating room. Be precise. Don't be afraid to open and make your incision bigger to be able to see and do what is right. Think 10 steps ahead and have a plan when you're done in the OR, thinking about the big picture. And don't be afraid to call for help, for help from senior partners or for a second opinion if you're not sure. And these lessons apply to everything we do as surgeons, not only for j pouch surgery. So what are these complications? Well, acute complications include leak and pelvic sepsis, fistulas, portal vein thrombosis, to name a few of them. An asthmatic leak is, the, is one of the most feared complications of all can manifest with ileus, fever, malaise, increased white blood cell count, anal pain, discharge, incontinence. Many can be the sites of leak, including the tip of the J, the ileal pouch anal anastomosis, the staple line of the body of the pouch. In 2013, Dr. Fazio, with a groundbreaking paper, showed that outcome and functional results after staple anastomosis had a statistically significant reduced leak rate when compared to hands-on anastomosis, and this paper changed how colon rectal surgeons make their pouch anastomosis. 
this is uh, just one of the many complex algorithms that uh, surgeons follow in case of anastomosis, anastomotic leak. As mentioned before, pelvic sex, sepsis is feared uh, complication and the surgeon needs to act early to be able to contain the pelvic fibrosis and avoid punch failure. The leak from the tip of the J is rare but considered the most common complication in one of the old theories. It may be uh, seen before or after stomach closure and can present as anterior upper pelvic abscess. Usually is amenable to percutaneous drainage, but rarely heals with drainage and IV antibiotics. So usually it requires a re-excision of the tip of the J. And this is a, just a beautiful picture from the Asker's test book that shows you how to um, redo the, J, the tip of the J. Sometimes, instead of a clear fistula, anastomotic leaks can, pre can present as a pouch sinuses. The diagnosis is usually made reviewing the GGE before the stoma closure. This complication can be approached uh, via drainage and uh, a lot of patients. With time, the sinus tract is mature enough to be able to create a common channel where the wall separating the pouch and the sinus is, the, is divided with energy device. Sometimes the sinus would disappear with catheter drainage. Sometimes the pouch would require revision or even excision. Many are the long-term complications of J-pouch surgery. Most commonly seen are strictures, pouch vaginal fistulas in female, bubbles, and afferent limb syndrome. Strictures probably are the most common. Some of them are not symptomatic, commonly have been related to hand-sewn anastomosis. Tension-free anastomosis are the key to avoid stricture formation. Pouch vaginal fistula, early up to six months after patient is in continuity, are usually technically sequelae. Late fistula should raise the concern for Crohn's disease. And the therapy includes repair or excision or even permanent diversion. Pouch valvus vulus etiology is still a topic of debate. We have been seeing many more in patients treated with minimal invasive techniques, but the reasons why this happens is still unclear. Could be this related to less adhesions in these patients? More studies have to be done to prove this. Afferent limb syndrome is a pretty rare condition. It is a distal small bowel obstruction caused by an acute angulation or prolapse or intersusception of the afferent limb at the junction of the pouch. It can be that misdiagnosed since pouch outlet issues can have similar presentation. Therapy is usually surgical with resection of angulated bowel or pexy of the limb. Sometimes it requires excision of the pouch. Efferent limb syndrome is really very, really rare. It's usually seen not, more, not really in J pouches, but more in S pouches. It can be caused by the long ATZ of J pouch, and the treatment includes usually anal intubation to help for evacuation of the pouch contents, and then reduce surgery. So are we getting any better with pou pelvic pouch uh, and uh, its complications? One of the studies that were published in 2012 shows that two, there was a 2.5 reduction in pouch failure in uh, um, patients that were operated between 2000 and 2010 compared to uh, patients that were uh, operated prior to that line. So yes, we still have to deal with 
pelvic sepsis. Yes, we have to deal with uh, pouch failures. But as per the studies, there is definitely an improvement. Probably there is more room to improve in the years to come. So pelvic pouch uh, construction is a complicated procedure, as you guys have seen through my talk, with a definite learning curve. Early recognitions of uh, acute complication as well as uh, long-term complication is important, and it's very important along with the successful management to decrease the risk of pouch failure and to preserve the pouch in this patient. So again, let me thank you, Dr. Richter, to uh, have kindly invited me to give you this uh, uh, brief lecture uh, on uh, pouch surgery. And uh, a great thank you to my mentor, Dr. Tracy Hall, who not only has provided several of the pictures that uh, you have enjoyed during this presentation, but has been a great mentor in teaching me all the different aspects of pelvic pouch surgery, as well as tricks on how to treat this uh, feared complication. Thank you very much.